In this video, we're gonna talk about improper integrals. So what I'd like you to do is pause the video and go check out the fundamental theorem of calculus. In the theorem, what it says is that in order to take the antiderivative and plug in the limits and subtract, in order to do that process, the function has to be continuous from x equals a to x equals b. So far in the course, we've mostly ignored this extra condition. So every integral you've done so far in the course has been proper. The function is continuous from x equals a to x equals b, and so therefore, it's completely valid to take the antiderivative and plug in the limits and subtract. But in this section, we're gonna include the possibility of something going to infinity. In one case, you'll have the x-coordinate going to infinity. That would be like the limits of integration having an infinity in it. And the second type will be if the actual function itself goes to infinity. That would be like a vertical asymptote in your function in between x equals a and x equals b. First, let's review the fundamental theorem of calculus. What the theorem says is that if f is continuous on the closed interval a to b, you're allowed to take the antiderivative, plug in b, plug in a, and subtract in order to evaluate the definite integral. Notice that the interval must be closed and bounded with the endpoints included. Of course, just as a reminder, the a and the b are the x values, and the y values are incorporated into the function because y is equal to f of x. An improper integral does not follow the format of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So what's going to go wrong here? Well, for one thing, perhaps the function is not continuous on the interval. This could potentially happen, say, if there was a vertical asymptote in between x equals a and x equals b. Remember that vertical asymptotes have the y values or the height of the function going to infinity. That is one possible way that we're going to break the conditions on the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, there's another way we could possibly break the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is that perhaps the x value goes to infinity such as if the a or the b was plus or minus infinity. In that case, the interval would not be closed and bounded, and if one of these was infinity, then we wouldn't be able to include infinity in order to get a closed interval. How do we deal with these cases? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Suppose that we've got a case where the y values are going to infinity at x equals a. That would be a picture, something like this, like perhaps there's a vertical asymptote at x equals a, and the height of the function approaches infinity as the x values get closer to a. Now this integral from a to b is now improper. It does not satisfy the conditions of the fundamental theorem of calculus because the f function is not continuous on the closed interval from a to b because there's this vertical asymptote. So what we're going to do is insert a t value that is slightly to the right and we're going to replace a with a t and then we're going to take the limit as t approaches a from the right. Notice that on the interval t to b, the function actually is continuous from t to b, and we can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus from t to b. After we apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, then we can take the result of that and take the limit as t approaches a from the right. So we have this limit in front. Okay, so let's consider some other possibilities. We're not going to write out an exhaustive list. Um, just to give you an idea of how to deal with y going to infinity or x going to infinity, you should be able to figure out a lot of other cases on your own. So let's write down one more. Suppose that the y values went to infinity at x equals b. Now this would be an improper integral because the height of the function is having a vertical asymptote at x equals b. That would correspond to a picture something like this, where a vertical asymptote is happening at x equals b and the height of the function goes to infinity as x approaches b. Now similar to the previous case, what we're going to do is take the integral from a up to a t value that is slightly to the left of b. That way, if we're just looking at this integral from a to t, the fundamental theorem of calculus absolutely does apply because we avoided the asymptote. We stayed to the side of the asymptote. And then we can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus just from a to t and take the result of that calculation and take the limit as t approaches b from the left. And finally, let's consider a case where one of the x values goes to infinity. That would be some sort of picture like this, where I have an integral from minus infinity up to some fixed value of b. Now clearly the interval from a to b, or from minus infinity to b, 
could not possibly be a closed bounded interval because I cannot include negative infinity in an interval. So this integral is improper and it does not satisfy the requirements of the fundamental theorem of calculus. I hope you can guess what we're about to do. It's exactly the same procedure as the previous cases. We're going to do an integral from a fixed value of t up to b. In other words, we're going to replace the infinite part with a t and we're just going to go from t to b where the fundamental theorem of calculus actually does apply. Then we can take the antiderivative plug in and subtract and take the result of that calculation and take the limit as t goes to negative infinity. I hope that you can figure out based on the information in the slide, what would you do if the b was infinite? How would you write out that limit? See if you can go into the book and figure out that extra case on your own. Okay, so anytime we have an improper integral where the function is not continuous, the x value goes to infinity or the y value goes to infinity or the interval is not closed and bounded, we have to rewrite it according to the previous slide. If the resulting limit exists, then the improper integral is said to converge. If the resulting limit that we wrote down on the previous slide, if that limit does not exist, then we say that the integral diverges. And just one more extra fact here which is that suppose we had a situation where both the a and the b value were infinite. That would be like an integral from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity. How do you deal with that case when two different things are going to infinity? The answer to that question is that you just separate it. You go from negative infinity to zero and then zero to infinity. And now you have two separate improper integrals. This one on the left is going to have a, a t replacing negative infinity and then you would take the limit as t approaches negative infinity. And the second one is a completely different problem where you would replace the upper bound with a t and then have t approach positive infinity. So you just separate it into two separate pieces if you've got two different infinities in your problem. Then you do each one of those integrals separately and we have a rule in this class that if either one of these integrals diverges then the total integral is said to also diverge. In other words if this thing is going to converge then both of these things better converge. If one of them diverges then the whole thing diverges. Okay, let's look at an example. This is an improper integral. Do you know why? What exactly is improper about it? It looks like a reasonable function from x equals zero to x equals one. So what the heck is wrong with this thing? What is it that's improper about this integral? See if you can pause the video and go back to the fundamental theorem of calculus and ask yourself which part of the fundamental theorem of calculus is broken here. Is the function continuous on the closed bounded interval zero one? I hope that you figured it out. At x equals zero, this function has a discontinuity. So we're going to replace this zero where the function has a discontinuity with a t. And then we're going to take the limit as t goes to zero from the right. In other words, we're taking the interval and we notice on this function that there's some sort of a discontinuity at x equals zero. So we replace zero with a t and then we're going to do the integral from t to one and take the limit as t approaches is zero from the right. You can see the little plus sign indicating that t should approach zero from the right. I always like to draw a little picture like this for myself so that I can make sure to determine whether t should be approaching the value either from the right or the left based on the configuration of the interval. All right, now that we've got our limit in place, let's do the various pieces. First, I'm going to ignore the limits of integration and the limit as t goes to zero from the right. Let's just work on the antiderivative. Here's our antiderivative problem. Problem. I hope that you can recognize this is a substitution problem with u equals 1 over x. That means that the du would be negative 1 over x squared, and so negative du is equal to dx over x squared. Plugging the u's in, we get e to the u times negative du. Taking the antiderivative and plugging x back in, we get negative e to the 1 over x as our antiderivative. All right, for the next part, in order to evaluate this, we're going to plug in 1, plug in t, and subtract, and then we're going to take the limit as t approaches 0 from the right. Okay, so as you can see, I'm using my antiderivative that I already figured out, and I'm indicating with the straight line that the antiderivative has already been taken. Here we go. I've got my expression with 1 plugged in, minus 
the expression with T plugged in, and the limit as T approaches zero from the right. And remember with limits that you can separate into pieces. This minus sign can come out in front of the limit, and I can take the limit of E by itself. Minus minus makes a plus, and I can take the limit of E to the one over T as a separate term. Remember our basics about limits. The limit of a constant is just the constant. This expression, which is just E, has absolutely no T's in it whatsoever. T can go wherever it wants. E is still E. So here, the answer for this first limit is negative E. This next limit we need to do piece by piece. Let's think about what's happening here. The T values are approaching zero from the right. Now just looking at the inner piece here, what does that mean for one over T? If T approaches zero, what does one over T approach? I hope you remember, it's infinity. And then finally, what happens when you have an exponent, which is infinity, plugged into the exponential? What is E to the infinity power? I hope you remember. You can maybe graph the exponential function to remember these basics. That goes to infinity. Okay, so we've got negative e for the first limit plus infinity for the second limit. Our final answer here is that this limit goes to infinity. The value of this limit does not exist. It's infinite, and so the integral diverges. Let's look at another example. In this example, you can see very clearly what makes this integral improper, which is that one of the x values is infinite. We clearly do not have a closed bounded interval, so the fundamental theorem of calculus does not initially apply. So I'm going to replace that infinity with a t, and then apply the fundamental theorem of calculus just from 0 to t, and then take the limit as t approaches infinity infinity for the resulting expression. Okay, similar to the previous example, let's just work on the antiderivative first, and then we'll worry about plugging in and taking the limit afterward. How do we take the antiderivative of x squared divided by the quantity 9 plus x to the 6? This is a tricky one. I'm really testing you on your basics for substitution. What you need to notice is that x to the 6 is the same as x cubed squared. Because a power raised to another power, you multiply the powers. We can also do a little bit extra here, which just to factor out this 9, and then we get a 1 left over for the first term, and x cubed over 3, quantity all squared. This is a u substitution problem. Composed inside the denominator here, I have x cubed over 3. As you can see, its derivative is appearing in the numerator. This is a classic substitution problem, with u equals x cubed over 3, and du is its derivative of x squared dx. Once we put the u's in, we essentially get 1 ninth times the integral of 1 1 over 1 plus u squared du. I hope you remember that's arctangent. Now that we've taken the antiderivative, we can plug in the limits and subtract, and then take the limit as t goes to infinity of the resulting expression. I'm plugging t into this expression to get 1 ninth arctan of t cubed over 3, and then I'm plugging 0 into this expression in order to get 1 ninth arctan of 0. And we're going to take the limit as t goes to infinity of this whole thing. Let's just recall a couple of facts. I hope you remember that tangent of 0 is 0, so therefore, arctangent of 0 is also 0. So this term is actually just 0. Again, some extra facts. The arctan function has this funny type of graph that I hope you remember from pre-calculus. It's this S-shaped function, and it's got horizontal asymptotes at y equals pi over 2 and y equals negative pi over 2. So let's see what's happening if we analyze the limit piece by piece. As t approaches infinity, t cubed is certainly approaching infinity, so the stuff getting plugged into the arctangent is becoming infinite. Now look at the graph of arctangent. What happens to the height of the arctangent function as the stuff getting plugged into the arctangent goes to infinity? What does the height of the function level off to pi over 2 because there's a horizontal asymptote at pi over 2 on the arctangent graph. So that's the value of the arctangent as t goes to infinity. Now just to summarize here, we do have the 1 9th which is in front. We've got the arctangent part approaching pi over 2, and of course this part went away, it's equal to 0. So my final answer is pi over 18. So this integral converges to pi over 18 because the limit that we took, it does exist, it's equal to a value of pi over 18. So we say that it converges to pi over 18. So I hope you enjoyed this video on improper integrals. And hopefully you'll be looking at integrals in a whole new light from this point forward. Is the function continuous? Does something go to infinity? Is it the x value? Is it the y value? And how do you deal with each one of those situations? So make sure to write down the rules for improper integrals and how to deal with all these different cases before you come to class. We'll see you soon.